Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight and we thank you because we know that you are going to help us by your grace to be doers of the word. We are praying that today your word will enrich our lives again in Jesus' name. We are asking that your spirit will take these words and make them practical in every one of our lives. That our lights will shine in the environments where we live. And through that shining light, we'll invite other people to know you. In Jesus' name we pray. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. We're looking at verses 1 to 16. And in this passage, we see the Apostle Paul demonstrating love, showing care, manifesting some concern for the church. He had a great desire and a consuming passion, a continuous concern to see that people got saved. And he also wanted very much to help the believers come to maturity. He was anointed and appointed to be an apostle, and yet he was a great prophet, an experienced pastor, an effective teacher as well as a traveling evangelist. And in the passage we're looking at today, you'll see all these various areas coming out of his ministry. An apostle, a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, and an evangelist. I've divided the passage into four sections. You'll see Paul encouraging the saints. You'll see him evangelizing the cities. You'll see him edifying the church. And you'll see the extensive service that he carried on in this passage as well as throughout his ministry for the Lord here on earth. Let's just look at verses 1, 2, and 3. Acts chapter 20. Verses 1, 2, 3. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. From the very beginning of the life, the Christian life of Paul the Apostle, he had a fairly good idea as to what the Lord wanted him to do. He knew that he was to preach the gospel. He knew that he was to make the light of the gospel known to the people that were living in darkness. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 26, while giving his testimony, he made King Agrippa to understand that the Lord called him. And from that very first moment, the Lord had shown him that he will serve his generation by giving them the light of the gospel. Acts 26. From verse 13, at midday, O king, I saw in the way light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me, and them we journeyed with me. And when we were all falling to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee, from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to the light and from the power of Satan unto God 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Wherefore, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. He knew that he was called of God, appointed of God, to serve the Lord, to preach the gospel, to bring light into the darkness of the lives of people. And immediately he started in that wonderful job. Here in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, we're told after the uproar had ceased, you know, he had faced some mob, multitude in riot at Ephesus. In fact, later he said that he fought with those human beings that were like wild animals at Ephesus. But then he did it for a good purpose. He had to fulfill his ministry. He endured hardness as a good soldier of Christ. Now after that uproar, that trial, after the trouble in Ephesus, the great persecution and opposition to the way, he didn't say, well, I must have to take it easy now. I must have to rest. I don't think I'll be able to go on. No, he said, necessity is laid upon me. I must preach the gospel. And so we're told in verse 1 of Acts 20 that Paul called unto him the disciples. He called unto him those disciples so that he could encourage them. So that he could give them more of the word of God. He could tell them to keep on holding on to the Lord. And he did it with all his heart in wanting to encourage them. He called unto him the disciples, and then he embraced them. He showed affection to them. He showed his love to them, ready to depart, to go to Macedonia. Then we're told in verse 2, when he had gone over those parts, he went from place to place, encouraging the believers, edifying the believers, and then he had giving them much exhortation everywhere he went he gave them the word of God and in exhorting them the exhortation was mainly that they will hold on to the Lord they will cleave unto the Lord in Acts of the Apostles chapter 14 Acts chapter 14 verse 22 confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Paul wanted to see the fruit of his labor and everywhere he went he encouraged the believers exhorting them that they will hold on to the Lord, they will remain in the faith now what did he mean by that? Why did he have to go around those believers exhorting them, encouraging them to hold on to the faith? Because he knew that the devil was in the world. And as the devil came to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ, so will he tempt everyone following the Lord Jesus Christ. And his exhortation was that they will completely separate from the devil and from the deeds of darkness, from the sins of the past. And they will cleave to the Savior, remain with the Savior. And they will not allow the flesh. They will not allow the devil. They will not allow the corruption around them. They will not allow the darkness around them to make them to leave the Lord. But they will remain with the Lord, cleave unto the Lord. Paul the Apostle was not so much concerned about entertaining the believers. But he was concerned about they keeping on with the Lord. You know, Paul the Apostle, he knew that in the days in which he lived, that the people will have a lot of difficulties having to follow the Lord because of the conditions of the last days. And he had to tell them very seriously what will be happening in the last days. That there will be a lot of sin going on in the world. There will be increase in sin going on in the world. And he wanted these disciples to look up to the Lord because the time was short. 
You remember in First Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He was telling Timothy, and he was still giving exhortation and encouragement to young believer Timothy, and a minister as well, saying now, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. He wanted to warn the believers. He wanted to exhort the believers that they must know that in the last days, some shall depart from the faith. You know, there are people that live as if they have got an irrevocable ticket to get into heaven. That whatever they do, whatever life they live, heaven was definite for them. But Paul the Apostle wanted young Timothy to know, and he wanted all the believers he came in contact with to know that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, that there is no irrevocable ticket in your hand, giving you what is called unconditional eternal security for the sinning saint to get into heaven, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And that the believers must be on their alert, because some in fact will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing, enticing spirits. Spirits that will tell them, cajole them, deceive them, trip them and trick them, and tell them, you could do anything and still get to heaven. And he was exhorting the believers that even some will give heed unto the doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Uh, you know, it, it surprises me that those people were so near to Pentecost. They were so near to the church on fire. They were so near to the church in Jerusalem. And yet, Paul told Timothy, watch out, watch out, because there will be people that speak lies in hypocrisy, and there will be people that will live licentious lives that will live terrible lives, that will in fact appear that their consciences were set with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats which God has created, to be received with thanksgiving of them, which believe and know the truth. Then he said in verse 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. And that was his exhortation to the believers. He was telling them, keep on following the Lord. Keep on holding to the Lord. Keep on resisting the devil and resisting temptation and live right. He did that to the believers. Come back to Acts chapter 20. Verse 1. He called unto him the disciples. He called unto him the disciples. Now, you know, the evangelist is concerned with the people out there, the degenerate, the unbelievers, the sinners. But, you know, the pastor is concerned with the people in here, the disciples. You see, the evangelist is always looking out. He's always looking out to get more people into the fold. And therefore, he's always looking outside the fence, outside the church boundary. He's always looking for those sinners out there, the degenerate. But you know, the pastor, the teacher, is always looking for the disciples in here. Those people that are born again already. Those people that are brought into the kingdom already. Those people whose sins are washed away already. And he's always calling them, calling them nearer, encouraging them, exhorting them, helping them to keep on with the Lord. And you know, there were times the Apostle Paul, in his ministry and office as an evangelist, he was looking out there, outside the church boundaries. But when it came to his ministry as a pastor, his ministry as a pastor. He was concerned about the disciples and he called those disciples unto him. We learn something from that. The pastor, a real pastor, a true pastor, is not just thinking about the attendance in the church, those who attended Monday Bible study. No, that's not a pastor. The pastor is not looking for those who attended. Thursday, miracle, revival time. 
that's not a pastor he's not looking for those who attended sunday worship service he's looking for the disciples you know because a pastor will realize that there are people that just attend not born again they just attend they are not disciples they are not members of the church but the pastor is always wanting to know who are the disciples and he separates the disciples from the degenerate he separates the saints from the sinners he separates the members from the outsiders and then he knows that there is there is a time that god will give him a message as a pastor to the disciples to the members to the saints in the church of god so that they'll keep on with the lord and that is why in our church here we must very seriously know the difference between a member of the church and an outsider who is a member of the church somebody that is already born again born again is a child of god and is living a righteous life according to the word of god but does that mean that everybody that is born again in the whole of lagos is a member of this local church no obviously no there are people that are born again outside this place that they are not members of this local church they may be members of that other local church what makes a person then that is born again to be a member of a local church well he voluntarily totally completely identifies with that church in doctrine he says i am born again but i know there are born again people outside there in the other churches but i am a member of this church because number one i am born again number two i identify i accept i recognize as the truth the doctrines taught from the bible in this church i do not only recognize it mentally but i go in a step further I show that in a practical way by submitting myself to water baptism in this local church. Understand, when somebody is born again, he can be baptized in that church, in that church, in that church, or in this church. But he says, I'm born again here, and I've not done water baptism. And because this is the church I am identifying with, I am not going to go to a person that has no label. A person that has no identity a person that has no church inclination or church identification and say take me to the riverside and baptize me i am identifying with this local church as my church and therefore i submit to water baptism you see such a person is saying i'm born again i identify with the teachings of the bible in the church not only that i have submitted myself to water baptism in the church not only that i agree with the vision and the mission and the commission given by christ to the church being carried on by this local church you see the activities of the churches are different that other church there they are born again that other church there they are born again that other church there they are born again and god has given the commission of going into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and every born again child of god wants to accept what the vision of the church and the mission of the church has given to the church in the great commission and he says how will i carry it out i can join this place and carry out that vision and mission I can join that other place and carry out that mission and vision or i can join that local assembly and carry out the vision and mission but which one will i be in the place where i am a member i identify with that church already i'm born again there already i'm baptized there already i identify with the doctrines of the bible taught in that church and now i identify by yielding my talents and my gifts and everything i have to identify with the vision and the mission of this church as giving from the great commission to the local assembly and when a pastor in a church sees all those four things born again 
accepts, acknowledges the doctrines of the church, is baptized in water, and is yielding all his talents and gifts to carry out the mission and the vision of the church. And he says, I'm available because I'm part of the church. When a pastor sees those four qualities, he says, that is a member of the church. And he is not just attending Monday Bible study. It's not just attending Thursday revival hour. It's not just attending Sunday worship service. It's a member of the church. Now, at the time Paul was to leave Ephesus temporarily, after that uproar, he was concerned with not those who came to the meetings. Many people came to the meetings of Paul the Apostle. But he collected together the members, the disciples, and he encouraged them. And as soon as leaders need to understand that actually you cannot reckon with those who are just attending. Our sooner leaders, our area leaders, our house fellowship leaders, you cannot just reckon with, well, they come to house fellowship. You reckon with, they are born again, they identify with the doctrines of the church, they submit to water baptism, and they're willing to plant and plunge the services, the talents, the gifts through the church to fulfill the mission and the vision of the church. And that's what the Apostle Paul recognized. And we're told that he called the disciples unto him and he embraced them. Embraced them. You see, that was a form of greeting in the early church. That they will embrace one another. The Apostle Paul, you have the holy keys writing his epistle to some of the churches. But understand, that was the customary thing. Like Judas kissed the Lord Jesus Christ. Like that woman was weeping and kissing the feet of Jesus. And Jesus told that Pharisee, You know, since I came in here, you didn't even wash my feet. Neither did you kiss my uh, feet. But look at this woman, the sinner. What she has done. Showing normal Jewish courtesy. And Paul the Apostle, he embraced those people. But as we well looked into church history on Christian greeting. Because um, church history has given us a lot of insight into the practices of the early church. Uh, you see today, there are people that have risen up, charismatics, Pentecostals, and a lot of people that are saying, we want a New Testament church. There is a cry in many parts of the world saying, let's go back to the Bible. Let's go back to the Bible. And it's unfortunate that they do not understand the Bible fully. And they do not go back to the Bible in the real sense of it. They do not go back to the repentance of the Bible. They do not go back to the restitution of the Bible. They do not go back to the sanctification, entire sanctification and purity, holiness of the Bible. And they are not going back to the supernatural in the Bible. But you know what they are looking at? They are going back to the Bible. And one of the things they are going back into is they embrace one another, men and women. A married and their marriage. A man embracing another person's wife right in the church. A young man embracing a young lady in the church. And they say, we're going back to the Bible. We're going back to the Bible. But if they were going back to the Bible, they will remember that the Apostle Paul said, flee fornication. Every sin that a man can commit, the greatest because he injures his body, he injures his soul, he damns his spirit in hellfire. And the, one of the greatest sins we'll find out in the New Testament is fornication, is adultery. And the Apostle Paul warned the believers very, very seriously. In fact, he said, fornication, uncleanness, filthiness, adultery must not be once named among you. And you find a lot of fellowships. And you say, yes, we're going back to the Bible. We'll embrace one another. You go and check up if you have a chance to read history. I mean church history. The embracing was between men and men and between women and women. That's what church history has given us. And uh, you, if you've read wide, you'll understand that the early church was pure. Pure. There were a lot of problems they had. They had problems with circumcision. They had problems with accepting the Gentiles into the church. They had problems with how shall we give equal right 
to the Jews and the Gentiles. They had problems with breaking down the middle wall of partition. They had problems with whether women should do this in the church or should not do this in the church. But there was a problem they never, 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 never had. Problems on circumcision, yes. Problems on Gentiles coming into the church, yes. Problems on what the Gentiles should eat, what the Gentiles should not eat. But there was a problem they never had. You never read of an apostle committing adultery. They never had that problem. Paul, Peter, James, John. You never read of a deacon in the church. You never read of a minister in the church committing adultery. Problems, administration, organization, all right. Problems in circumcision, all right, but you never read of fornication and adultery with those apostles. But what do we find out from the charismatics today? Let's go back to the Bible. Let's go back to the Bible. And all they see in the New Testament, they won't see the holiness. They won't see the sanctification. They won't see purity of life. All they want to see is Paul embraced them. No. He wasn't embracing another person's wife. He wasn't embracing those young ladies. He was a man that said, you know, how holily and righteously and unblameably we walk among you that believe. And he said, be ye followers of me. And so we understand that Paul the Apostle, he manifested love to those disciples. He knew that disciples were different from the sinners. And he concentrated on those disciples and he encouraged them. And then we're told he went in, he went into Greece. And there he abode three months. And again, because he will never compromise the truth of the word of God. When the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. You know, everywhere he went, he got into trouble. Because he will never, never, never compromise. And the Lord is calling us today that in these last days, there will be a lot of chance to compromise. To compromise on, number one, the doctrines of the Bible. Number two, to compromise on the standard of holiness and righteousness. Number three, to compromise on having money and material things at all cost. And if you're a believer... And if you're a preacher, that danger is there. But Paul the Apostle, his eyes were always looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. His eyes were always on the goal, saying, I do everything possible that I might attain unto the first resurrection. His eyes were always on the Lord who had called him to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And he wasn't going to get entangled with the spirit of the last days, with compromise. Because of that, he stood firm with the doctrines of the Bible. And I must call, I must call your attention to this. In your own life. Now, are you compromising on the doctrines of the Bible with your relatives? With fellow believers in other churches? always believers in this church here are you standing on the doctrines of the bible saying if i have to stand alone i would defend the faith i will honestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints number two how about your behavior how about your life are you compromising on the standard of righteousness and the standard of holiness that the Bible has made very plain and very clear to us. Are you able to stand your ground and say, this is the word of God and this is where I stand according to the teaching of the word of God? You see, Paul the Apostle, he recognized that. That if he was going to please the Father, if he was going to please God, he must stand uncompromisingly on the doctrine. Number two, he must stand uncompromisingly on his life, his behavior, then on having money and material things. You know, this world, we used to say that the people of the world are running after the mirage of life. We used to say that. But it's not just the unbelievers now, not just the world now. Many people all over the world who profess to be born again, they too, they are running after the mirage of life. 
something they're reaching after they never get. They're looking for money at all costs. They're looking for material things at all costs. And they do that to the point of compromising their faith. And they marry that man and have money and have material things. They'll compromise their faith. They will not want to wait for the Lord again. They will not want to pray to the Lord again. They will not want to find out the will of God again. They want money and material things at all costs. And there are men that will do that in business. They profess to be Christians. But they wouldn't uh, be concerned about the deep things, the deep truths of the word of God. They want that promotion at all costs, that contract at all costs, that money at all costs, because of the spirit of the last age that has come into them. But Paul the Apostle, he was exhorting those people to stand firm for the truth and stand for the faith. The doctrine, the life, then your relationship, your attitude to money and material things. And because he will never compromise, he always got into trouble. He will persecute him. And he will move from one place to the other. But the persecution actually never stopped the work that he was going to do for the Lord. And you must check up your own life again. All these things that we have been reading about Paul the Apostle. How has it gone down with you in your own life? He encouraged the saints. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Be ye followers of me. That's how he exhorted the believers. Those members... In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Be ye therefore followers of God as their children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us, and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for his sweet smelling savor. Look at verse 3. I'm sure many of you old members of the church have seen this before. Uh, but you know there's something that will happen in the last days. In the last days, some of the things you knew before, the very attitude and the spirit of the last days may take them away from your mind. That's why Peter said that God had told him he was soon to put up this tabernacle. But before he, do, before he goes, he must keep the believers in remembrance of the things they knew before. Verse 3, but fornication. And all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. So now leaders to hear that. Fornication, adultery. If you are going to be accused of anything, if the pastor is going to accuse you of anything, well, it may be that you didn't submit your report in time. That's bad, but we can manage with that. If you're going to be corrected about anything, let it be well, uh, your zone did not grow in number in time. Well, we can manage all that. But don't be accused of fornication. Don't be accused of adultery. Because it says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named. Once be named among you as it becomes sins, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient but rather the giving of thanks. You know, the Apostle Paul exhorted those believers so that they will stand firm in the word of the Lord. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 31. Acts 20, 31. Therefore, watch and remember. That by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul exhorting, encouraging the saints. Now Acts chapter 20 from verse 3 to verse 6. Acts chapter 20 from verse 3 to verse 6. And there he abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, he purposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopata of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Sedunchus. 
Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. These going before tarried for us at Troas, and we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleaving bread, and came unto them to Troas in five days, and there we abode seven days. Here is Paul the evangelist evangelizing the cities. You know, something has struck me in the life of Paul the apostle. He had no time for sightseeing. You know, sometimes you have some preachers, some pastors, not condemning those people out there, but I'm instructing the preachers in here. Paul the Apostle said, What have we to do to judge the people outside? But for those of us who are inside, on whom the Lord has made me a pastor and a leader, we have to correct so that you are not like the people out there. You know, there are preachers that will remove all their clothes and say they are going for swimming. There are preachers that will take uh, guns and arrows and say they are going for hunting. There are preachers that will, you know, just spend hours and days on sightseeing. And there are preachers that will travel from country to country, not to preach, not to evangelize, but just to have a nice time. Just to have a nice time. Well, whether that is good or bad, all we can say is that that is different from Paul the Apostle. Because he was always evangelizing from city to city, from city to city, he was always evangelizing. Well, when you do it alone and you go alone, that is pretty different from Paul the Apostle. But these people, there are a lot, there are some preachers that will take their wives and they'll go on just sightseeing, just new honeymoon again, souls are dying, souls are perishing. The churches are getting into error, into false doctrine, and yet they'll go with their wives and um, just have a nice time, perhaps three months of the year. Well, are we saying that they're going to hell? No, I'm only saying that's different from Paul the Apostle. But listen, it is not just stopping at that. There are preachers, and I've met some of them outside. That will leave their wives and pick a woman in their congregation and travel long distance in aeroplane, in cars, travel with another person's wife. Members of their churches. Or somebody who has not married. Or somebody whose husband has perhaps separated from. And this is a preacher now, a great evangelist now. And then he goes with another person's wife. On the last days, there will be many surprises. When you think about the people that will enter into the kingdom of God, but alas, the secret things will be brought into the open. So, Paul the Apostle, he was different from many of the people we see here today. And if this church is a Bible church, as we say it is, if this church is deeper, more than the other people there, as we say it is, as we write on the signboard, if there is a life, a Christian life, that we call deeper life, as we put on the signboard, let's follow the Bible. Let's follow the Bible. Leave other people's wives alone. Leave all those ladies alone. If you want to travel out, travel with your wife. In fact, you know, one might even say, when you think about what is going on in the world, Listen to me now. This is church. And as a pastor of my church, I have authority to teach you the truth. Looking at what is going on in the world, it is best to say, if you are a man, you are going to travel alone. Not just a preacher. Not just zonal leader. Not just, um, not just a real leader. Not just Christian worker. Just a member of the church. You are a businessman. But you are a Christian. If you are going to travel, it will be best to travel with a man if your wife is not able to go with you. So that you will know that everything is in the open. 
rather than you just tell us in our church here well i'm always traveling i'm always traveling sleeping in all sorts of places about and there's no man with you and your wife is not with you and only heaven knows what you're doing so then paul the apostle you know paul the apostle great great mighty man when barnabas could not travel with him they chose silas he said no i'd like somebody to go along with me and see everything that is going on because you know paul the apostle he didn't get married and as a man that wasn't married and he traveled a lot he wasn't just you know going here and going there all alone and lydia will say if you have counted me faithful come and live inside my house and paul said that is all right timothy silas and um, tychicus all of you get in and i'll be following you but never paul alone say now timothy go and find a place in town and live there we'll meet tomorrow morning well you know i'm an apostle an apostle can never commit sin you see i'll be staying with lydia uh, overnight in fact we'll be having night vigil together apostle is having night vigil with sister that would be terrible but you know paul never did that and you know in the world many many things are happening and that is why it's important for us to understand that if you are traveling all about traveling all about you're a businessman you're a contractor you're this you're that travel with your assistant travel with somebody not your secretary is a lady and i hope if you're a member of this church and you're a secretary i hope you never travel with a man whoever the man may be he may be an apostle i hope you never travel with that man if you are the secretary but you are not the wife alone be very careful these are the last days so paul the apostle he traveled with um, a lot of these people and he went from place to place he went from place to place preaching the gospel because he evangelized his heart was in evangelism and today too our hearts must be in evangelism in second timothy chapter 4 second timothy chapter 4 verse 5 but watch thou in all things endure afflictions do the work of an evangelist make full proof of thy ministry his heart was in evangelism and he really evangelized from city to city in romans chapter 1 romans chapter 1 from verse 13 now i would not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes i purpose to come unto you but was led hitherto that i might have some fruit among you also even as among other gentiles i am debtor both to the greeks and to the barbarians both to the wise and to the unwise so as much as in me is i am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at rome also that's the heart of an evangelist and that was the heart of paul the apostle and we who have received the commission from the lord who have got the vision to evangelize the mission to evangelize that is what we must do today in a, in a first corinthians chapter 9 first corinthians chapter 9 verses 16 and 17 for though i preach the gospel i have nothing to glory of for necessity is laid upon me yea woe is unto me if i preach not the gospel for if i do this sin willingly i have a reward but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me now when this uh, ministry started deeper christian life ministry we were serious on evangelism and we're still serious on evangelism now we expect every believer to evangelize to win souls to talk one to the other and bring sinners to the fold and bring sinners to the foot of the cross but now we have expanded our outreach in evangelism originally for years it was just person to person evangelism person to person evangelism and boss evangelism but god has led us into various types of evangelism and we thank god for the fruit that god is bringing up in the church we've gone into crusades we've also evangelized through the media radio newspaper television 
And we thank God for the many people that have come to the Lord as a result of these various types of evangelism. I pray that this revival fire, this evangelism zeal will never die off from us in Jesus' name. But everywhere we go, everywhere we are, we'll be able to stand and we'll be able to declare that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. But it's not only to stand and declare it. We must be able to declare it in the wisdom of the Lord. Because it takes wisdom. In fact, the Bible says, He that winneth souls is wise. And we must have the wisdom of the soul winner. The wisdom of the evangelist. Not only the message, not only the wisdom, but then there must be the power to go along with it. The evangelist, in the, the evangelist in the early church was a man of power as well as a man of persuasion. With the preaching of the word of God, he persuaded the people to come. But with the power of the miraculous, he compelled the people to come. The preaching persuasively, the power compelling them to come. And today, it must still be in that same way as a church that we must bind together in the power of God so as to get the work done now the Lord has been helping us to get this done then we must still unite together in prayer we must still take note of the word of God that is the basis of the whole of the evangelism and then whenever we evangelize the follow-up must be sound we must not be careless with the follow-up because as I've told you, the, the Apostle Paul was concerned about the disciples, not just about the people that attended. You know, sometimes we give attendance and we say, well, uh, at the Crusade, Tapa, Balewa, um, sorry, um, National Stadium, thousands, hundreds of thousands came. That's all right, but God is not interested in just the attending people the attendance is interested in the people that eventually ended up becoming disciples and members in the church who are growing onto maturity then we look at acts chapter 20 from verse 7 acts chapter 20 verse 7 and upon the first day of the week the disciples came together to break bread the disciples came together to break bread Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. That's referring to the Lord's Supper. Uh, you know, we've had difficulty getting through and having the Lord's Supper. We've got all the things ready. But then, the membership of the church should be well defined. Not just that we bring everybody together on Sunday morning and everybody is there, the members and the non-members, the saints and the sinners, and we just say, well, we're going to have the Lord's Supper now. If you are qualified, if you are a member, take it. If you are not, don't take it. They didn't do it like that in the early church. They didn't do it like that in the early church. The apostles knew these are the disciples. These are the members. It wasn't left for the people to decide. If you like, take it. If you don't like, take it. They knew because they had done everything they ought to do. And the membership was well defined. That they knew that these are the members of this local church. The church in Jerusalem. And then they, they came together and they took the Lord's Supper. And here again it says, upon the first day of the week. When the disciples... Not just when the attendants, when the interested worshippers. No, when the disciples came together to break bread. Zona leaders and area leaders. Get this work done. And do what the Bible wants us to do. And I've already given you as I, was, as I started the message on how you know members. Then get everything settled. And come back to the early church principles of church work. Then Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continuing his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber, where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a, young, a certain young a man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, uh, you know, sometimes you think I preach long. When we get to heaven, you'll have an interview with Paul the Apostle. 
and ask him, how long did you normally preach? You know, sometimes you come and you are hearing him preaching and we spent only 40 minutes and then you are turning around your bench and you are changing your position and you are saying, when are we going to finish? How lucky you are, you were not in the world at the time of Paul the Apostle. That apostle could preach and he'll keep you for three hours and then he'll say, I've now finished my introduction, let me give you the message. And it was a wonderful time. And now it says, when Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third lodge and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him, said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. That's power. I said that's power. Yes. You know, it's wonderful when preaching is not just alone, when it is not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but right in that place that Paul the apostle was preaching. That's how we know the position of the man. That's how we know it's just not a lay reader. That's how we know it's not just a catechist. That's how we know he's not just in the laity. That's how we know he's an apostle. He said, the signs and the wonders of the apostles, they were manifested before you. He was preaching, preaching, long, long preaching. And then this man, Eutychus, he fell down and he was taken up dead. And Paul went down, fell on him, embraced him. Remember, Eutychus, a young man, Paul, a man, embracing him. The Bible is very, very simple and direct. If we want to actually follow the Bible, embracing is not for men and women in the church or even outside the church. Now, embracing him, he said, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. And when he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten, then he said, as I was saying before, I had reached point one, point two, point three. Now point four. Then we are told he talked. What does the Bible say? A long while. I'm telling you, that man could preach. And when you get to heaven, you will remember to ask him. It was long, long preaching. Even to the day, till the break of day. Think about a man that, uh, you know, people came from their houses for just uh, evening Bible study. And he preached and preached and preached and he said, this is long sermon. In the middle of the long sermon, this uh, Eutychus fell down and died. And then he said, don't go away, we have not finished yet. Don't go away. Then he went and then he prayed for that man. That man got up, he said, sit down and listen to the rest of the message. You missed a part when you were sleeping. Then he started again and preached a long while until daybreak. We learned something. The early church, they loved preaching. They loved the Bible. And as long as the word of God was going on, the word of God was going on, they were at ease. That's how you know members of the church. And that's also how you know the people that are just coming, not part of them, but just coming. The people that cannot sit down under one hour message. Immediately you finish, you start the message, 10 minutes, they have got up and they are just roaming about the church compound. But the people that are members, the people that just, that are determined, they want to get to heaven. It doesn't matter, one hour message, one hour hour's message, two hours message, they are drinking in the word of God. They are taking in the word of God. And they love it. And they will never want to miss, they deliberately want to miss the word of God. And so the early church, they gave themselves to it. And in verse 12, and they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. That means they were comforted very, very much. Paul the Apostle, he edified the church. And we who are workers in the church, we must follow after that pattern. Edify the church in everything that we do. Whatever you are doing in the church, you are preaching, you are encouraging, you are exhorting, you are counseling, you are doing anything in the church, whatever. Make sure that you do it to edify the church edify the believers build up the believers but then how do we do that as preachers workers and members that means you'll devote yourself to build on the spiritual lives of all people in the church and you first live a challenging pure exemplary life and then by preaching or exhortation 
you tell other people how to live right and then you pray for one another. Then it's extensive service. Look at it from verse 13. And we went before to shape and sailed unto Assos. There intending to take him Paul. For so had he appointed, minding himself to go to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and there to Miti Mitilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chaos. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trogilion. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. He had the itinerary planned out. His work was extensive. You know, when your work is very extensive, planning is very, very important. And Paul the Apostle went from place to place. And the work was extensive geographically. But not only geographically, it was extensive in a social way. Let me show you what I mean. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. And to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Then to them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. You see how extensive the ministry was. He attempted to reach the Jews. He attempted to reach the Gentiles. Then he says in verse 22, To the weak I am as weak, that I might gain and win the weak. Then he said, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. An extensive ministry. Extensive ministry. That's why this church carries on an extensive ministry of reaching school children of reaching campus students, of reaching the average people, of reaching the top people in society, of reaching foreigners, of reaching the local government areas and villages, the illiterates, of reaching the people that understand English and you can hear my message in English, of reaching the people that can only hear the message in the vernacular over there, of reaching the people that are abroad, people in West Africa, in East Africa, and people outside Africa. Extensive ministry. Reaching people that have understood a little of the word of God. And reaching people that know nothing of the doctrine of the word of God. Reaching people that dress in different, different ways. Different customs, different culture, different attitude, different background. Extensive ministry. And since the ministry is as extensive as that carried on by the Apostle Paul, that's why this church has a lot to learn from the ministry, from the outreach of the Apostle Paul. Then in verse 23, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Then he says, Know ye not that they which run in a race, run all but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under, and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. You know, when I hear an apostle, great, great apostle, talking like that, it makes me to want to just examine my life. It makes me to just want to say, well, not just activities alone, not just preaching alone. And I hope you do the same thing, that if Paul the apostle, a man that had gone to the third heavens, 
a man that had seen visions of the glories of the coming age a man that has had the very voice of the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected Jesus Christ a man that has had the revelation of the mysteries of the kingdom a man that has been empowered to be an apostle at the same time an evangelist at the same time a prophet at the same time a pastor at the same time a teacher at the same time a writer at the same time somebody that was full of inspiration and full of the doctrines deep deep doctrines of the church a man that had intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ a man that could raise the dead a man that could cast out devils a man that could heal the sick a man that could make blind eyes open a man that could make the lame to walk if that man will say I run not as uncertainly and I fight not as beating the air but I keep my body under now if the apostle could say that how about you you shouldn't be careless live your life in carelessness and just say well just activities 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 as a Christian as a worker as a preacher as a zonal leader as a coordinator as anybody that you'll keep your body under and put it bring it under subjection lest by enemies after you have preached to others and you have brought other people into the kingdom then at last you'll be a castaway how i pray for you that all these words you are hearing will get you closer to the lord will get you farther away from the devil make you holier than you were before but you have to do like the apostle paul deliberately cut away things that will get you into sin into evil things that will get you nearer to the devil you cut everything away and all the time you put your body under all the time you put your body under you bring it under subjection so that after this world of activities and preaching and praying and working for the lord you will not be a castaway let's rise up and pray talk to the lord